Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 14. A Wolf by the Ears. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Last time, we covered the opening moves of the new English Parliament, one day to become known as the Long Parliament. Opponents of royal policy had impeached and arrested the Earl of Strafford and Archbishop William Lord, as well as other high-ranking champions of personal rule. Critics of the King, imprisoned and mutilated during the Eleven Years' Tyranny, were released to jubilant crowds, and negotiations with the Covenanters had been productive. This week, we will cover the trial of the Earl of Strafford. He was resolved to fight the charges laid at his feet, and he would not go down easily. The suit against Strafford came on behalf of all three Stuart kingdoms, and the Covenanter and Irish commissioners were united in their pursuit of Strafford. Strafford's profiteering in Ireland, and his thorough policy, had alienated many, and this motivated the Irish commissioners to seek redress. For the Covenanters, his Irish policies were also a source of hatred. The Black Oath, which Strafford had enforced on Scottish colonists during the Scottish Crisis, effectively painted all Scots as potentially disloyal, and demanded their rejection of the National Covenant. This was a thorn in the Covenanter government's side, but Strafford's main threat was his status as chief incendiary of the wars. He, it was argued, had been one of the strongest voices pushing the king towards violence, rather than a sensible compromise with his Scottish subjects. Strafford had to go if there was going to be any true peace between the kingdoms. An interesting aside, or at least interesting to me, and it's my podcast, so it goes in, is that before this trial took place, the two Houses of Parliament argued whether, firstly, the Commons as a whole would be permitted to attend, and once this was agreed, whether the MPs would be permitted to wear their hats. For the Commons, if the entire House sat bareheaded in the presence of the House of Lords, it implied their inferiority to the upper house. The eventual compromise agreed was that the bulk of the attending MPs would wear hats, securing the dignity of the House of Commons. But the prosecuting and speaking MPs would doff their caps when addressing the Lords, therefore showing due deference to their social betters. And there we go, just a small, interesting little cultural window into the past. Both Charles I and his wife and queen, Henrietta Maria, attended Strafford's trial almost daily, often bringing the young Prince of Wales, Charles, with them. Their attendance was matched by a large public audience, who had come to watch the hated Strafford face justice. The trial truly began on the 22nd of March, after Strafford had spent four months in the Tower of London, preparing to fight for his life. It became apparent that he was expected to fight this fight with one hand tied behind his back. He requested the right to call witnesses. The Commons argued against this right, and the Lords compromised by allowing him to call witnesses, but those witnesses would not be under oath. Strafford asked to have legal counsel speak on his behalf. The Commons opposed this. The Lords compromised by allowing him to have counsel who could speak on his behalf on legal matters, but not on anything else, including the facts of the case. Now, these weren't unusual conditions, and indeed, treason defendants usually faced serious handicaps compared to those facing less serious charges. But it's important to keep in mind that Strafford was working with limitations. Speaking of charges, Strafford's enemies were having some trouble working out exactly how to destroy him. He had been accused of treason, but the traditional definition of treason involved actions against the person of the monarch, and that monarch, Charles, still supported Strafford. The charges were formulated after two months of debate by a committee chaired by John Pym. Pym was, 
as Dr. Jonathan Healy succinctly described him, a notorious asshole. These charges were presented to the Lords and to Strafford, and consisted of several general articles and 28 specific articles. The specific articles drew from almost a decade of Strafford's career. Examples from his time as President of the Council of the North, his time as Lord Deputy of Ireland, and from the Scottish Crisis and the Wars. The articles, combined with remonstrances from the other two kingdoms, went down a storm with the public. Point after point created the image of Strafford as a power-hungry tyrant who built a career treading on the liberties of Charles's honest subjects. His prosecutors, led by Pym, tried to forge an argument based around Strafford's influence over the king, leading said king to violate the bonds between sovereign and subject. By advising Charles to act illegally, he had fostered resentment against the monarch and so undermined the monarch's ability to rule. Ergo, treason. It's certainly an argument, but a tenuous and almost radical one. As Diane Perkis neatly puts it, Pym seems to have reversed accidentally into radicalism because of expediency. But, as Craig Lerner, writing in the University of Chicago Law Review, states, as a legal document, Pym's indictment was a hot mess. My words, not his. He finds two major flaws with Pym's approach. Firstly, he overcharged, sending a barrage of allegations at Strafford. The second was Pym's use of witnesses who had very public axes to grind with the Earl. They were eager to testify against him, but this, this willingness, cast doubt on the legitimacy of their testimony. As we'll see, both these flaws will trip up the prosecution, as Strafford stands his ground with skill and grit. Strafford ably defended himself in court with a stamina which Lerner describes as awe-inspiring. Quote, From mid-March to mid-April 1641, he was in trial six days a week, from nine in the morning to two p.m. He acted as his own attorney, cross-examining and calling witnesses, and arguing mixed questions of law and fact. Strafford then spent the remainder of the afternoon each day engaged in personal and official correspondence, for despite being in the Tower of London, he continued to be the King's most valued advisor in a time of national emergency. The rest of the evening, and through the night, he prepared for the next day's trial with his lawyers." End quote. Just a few examples of Strafford's defence, and how Pym's overzealous approach backfired. The first, the very first, of the 28 articles which specified how Strafford had acted illegally alleged that as President of the North, he had illegally expanded his council's jurisdiction. Strafford, in return, pointed out that he'd been in Ireland when that had occurred, and that the prosecution had backdated the documents. Again, this was the very first charge, and Strafford had just dismantled it. This is what Lerner means by overcharging. Pym had thrown everything, including the kitchen sink, at Strafford, and while some of it might stick, the sheer number of charges that didn't brought into question those that did. The second article charged Strafford with claiming that the king was greater than the law. The prosecution's problem was that their only witness to this statement was completely deaf. Strafford laughed in their faces and made a convincing argument that, even if he had said those words, with context, they had meant the opposite. Another article focused on the Oath of Allegiance, the Black Oath, which Strafford had enforced on Scots in Ireland. Strafford retorted by questioning how on earth enforcing an oath of loyalty to the crown constituted an act of treason against that crown. Literally, how? How does that make sense? In the case of the witnesses, many of whom were public enemies of Strafford, the Earl fruitlessly attempted to have them thrown out for their bias. The Lord's decision to keep them was, Lerner states, the legally correct one, but nevertheless, Strafford took many of the witnesses to pieces. Either highlighting their unsuitability to testify, cross-examining them on their contradictions, or dragging them down into the dirt with him. 
Most of the evidence and witnesses that would be used against Strafford were focused on his rule in Ireland. It's certainly true that Strafford had governed Ireland in ways that would be completely unacceptable if tried in England. But Ireland, despite being a kingdom in its own right, was not an equal in the minds of many of the English lords sitting in judgment of Strafford. So what if he ruled through military force and made arbitrary decisions? It was only Ireland. And after all, Strafford needed to only point to every previous Lord Deputy to find evidence of other men acting the same way. In many cases, he had precedent on his side. One of the notable witnesses against Strafford's Irish governance was the Earl of Cork. Another of the enemies of Strafford's career, Cork was one of the most powerful and wealthy of the new English aristocracy. He had clashed with the Lord Deputy over taxes and the legitimacy of his land claims. If you recall, as Lord Deputy, Strafford had forced the Earl of Cork to move the memorial for his late wife in Dublin Cathedral. Since then, however, Cork had defended Strafford to the King and struck up a productive relationship with the Lord Deputy. While Strafford's star was on the rise, Cork was his firm friend. But after the Second Bishop's War and the imminent Parliament which was sure to strike at Strafford, Cork realigned himself. Patrick Little, in his article on the relationship between the two men, describes Cork as politically ambidextrous. He attempted to keep his options open between both sides because, quote, if the opposition was successful in forcing reform, Cork could be taken to task for his royalist connections. If the king dissolved parliament and resumed personal rule, the earl's opposition friends might become a liability. Either way, Cork's honour and prosperity could be put in jeopardy. The personal vendetta with Strafford, so often attributed to Cork, was a luxury which the Earl could not afford in the maelstrom of 1641, end quote. So, while Cork didn't spur on the impeachment efforts, he was happy to take part once the trial came underway and acted as a witness in February. Even then, however, Cork superglued himself to the fence, claiming that he'd not brought his papers as evidence to avoid incriminating his Lord of Strafford. However this played out, Cork intended to be on the winning side. Unfortunately for Cork, in response to his testimony, Strafford brought up their previous dealings and cast doubt on the official decision over Cork's land dispute. This was, in the words of Little, potentially disastrous for the Earl. The King was heard to comment that, despite Strafford being on trial for his life, he would, quote, rather be my Lord of Strafford than my Lord of Cork. Cork spent much of the next few months attempting to undo the damage these allegations had caused him, petitioning the Lords and meeting with the King, to ensure that everyone knew that these allegations by Strafford were completely false. They were, of course, anything but but there were bigger fish to fry. The prosecution's strategy relied on proving that Strafford had both acted illegally and advised the king to do the same. It also set a dangerous precedent. Strafford, displaying the charisma and wit he would show throughout this fight for his life, took Pym to task for this stretch of logic, speaking to his judges and to the gallery. Quote, You, your estates... Your posterities lie all at the stake if such learned gentlemen as these, whose lungs are well acquainted with such proceedings, shall be started out against you. If your friends, your counsel, were denied access to you. If your professed enemies admitted to witness against you. If every word, intention, circumstance of yours be alleged as treasonable, not because of a statute, but a consequence, a construction of law heaved up in a high rhetorical strain, and a number of supposed probabilities. End quote. His opponents, he argued, were attempting to take dozens of smaller crimes, if they were indeed crimes, and combine them into a single act of treason. It was a dangerous precedent for any holder of public office. In a way, the roles of Strafford and his prosecutors had suddenly reversed. He had been contemptuous of the law and those who practised it, 
but now urged his lordly judges to view the law in strictly textual, legalistic ways. His opponents, many of whom were themselves trained lawyers, urged the lords to focus on the fundamental laws of England, a woolly and undefined term, rather than statute and common law. The most damning accusation against Strafford came from the testimony of Sir Henry Vane, the Secretary of State. Vane had once been an ally of Strafford, but they'd fractured over the Scottish crisis. Strafford then made this fracture permanent by impugning Vane's honour upon his promotion to the earldom. When he became Earl of Strafford, he took as his secondary title the Barony of Raby, which was Vane's own seat in County Durham. This was an unforgivable and deliberate affront, which Strafford would have reason to regret when Vane stood as witness against him. Vane, on his third appearance as a witness, gave the damning testimony that Strafford, in a Privy Council meeting in May 1640, had said the following. You have an army in Ireland. You may employ it to reduce this kingdom. The prosecution declared that this kingdom meant England, despite the Privy Council discussing the Scottish War at the time. However, even if the Elder Vane's testimony was accepted, it was not enough to constitute a treason charge. The law required two witnesses for a charge of treason, and while Strafford had not lent on this requirement much previously, it became central to his case now. No other Privy Councillor would testify that they heard him say these words. There was no second witness, and Strafford hammered the prosecution on this point. His success in parrying these accusations worried many members of the Commons. They had, one commented, the wolf by the ears. If they let him go, they would, quote, hardly escape scot-free. He would surely get his revenge. A striking development in the North African nation of Tunisia. Tonight, after violent protests that have lasted for weeks, the Tunisian government has fallen. You don't know if it's tear gas. It could be bullets. I didn't expect to see one of my friends shot in the chest in front of me. I'm Aaron Brown. And I'm Cyrus Rodell. And this is Revolution One from the Agora Podcast Network where we bring the story of the Tunisian Revolution to life through the voices of those who lived it. I was the mother of one of the martyrs who pushed me to take the photos. She was saying, you have to show the world what's really happening in Tunisia. We wanted to know what it takes to bring down a dictator, so we went to where the Arab Spring began, to Tunisia, where, ten years ago, a desperate young fruit seller set himself on fire and set a new course for his country and the world. We'll tell you the incredible story of how a military officer and a hairdresser managed to create an ironclad police state that they ruled from yachts and mansions for 23 years. And over the course of eight episodes, we'll hear from the political prisoners, spies, and students who, armed with nothing more than rocks and Facebook, brought it all down. 10 years on, we're still feeling the effects of the Arab Spring today. From the global migration crisis to the rise in nationalism in Europe and the U.S. And with popular uprisings from Hong Kong to Black Lives Matter still gripping the headlines, we thought it would be the perfect time to look back to Revolution One. Join us on January 14th, wherever you get your podcasts. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. 
as I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RECORDEDHISTORY. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RECORDEDHISTORY. Babbel language for life. Mysteries, hoaxes, folklore, conspiracy, and pseudo-history. Topics sometimes avoided by historians who don't want to normalize nonsense or draw attention to the blind spots in our knowledge of the past. But these are some of our most intriguing tales. The Lost Colony of Roanoke, The Man in the Iron Mask, The Princes in the Tower, The Battle of Los Angeles, The Turin Shroud. Stories like these fraught with ambiguities and falsehoods and suggesting alternate views of history, not only entertain, but also teach us to view the past and the present with a critical eye. Join me, Nathaniel Lloyd, as I delve into these stories on my podcast, Historical Blindness, and shine a light in the darker corners of the past. New episodes every other Tuesday, available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and most podcast apps. Sir Henry Vane's testimony remained weak, and Strafford insisted it be discarded. And this appears to have happened until Vane's son, Henry Vane the Younger, re-enters our story. We've met Vane Jr. before in New England, Former governor of the colony of Massachusetts, he'd returned to England at the end of the 1630s and now stood as an MP. Vane the Younger gave Pym a note he'd found in his father's office, which minuted Strafford's saying the damning phrase. At this revelation, his father was outwardly angered with his son for betraying his trust and providing the prosecution with such a windfall. But those at the time and since have wondered whether the father-son duo planned this. The theory goes that the father could lay the groundwork for his rival's fall while not insisting on Strafford's guilt, and the son could claim his conscience, insisted he shared the note. Still, this was not enough, and Strafford's opponents, foreseeing the collapse of the trial, or worse, the proroguing or dissolution of Parliament, feared what an acquitted and vengeful Strafford would do. This trial had not been the triumph his enemies had hoped. So, they flipped the proverbial board. On the 10th of April, 1641, after Strafford once again won a procedural victory from the Lords, the Commons withdrew from the Hall as one. Once gathered in their own chamber, Arthur Hasselrig proposed a Bill of Attainder against the Earl. This would condemn Strafford, by a simple vote on his guilt. No matter the flimsiness of the evidence, despite his able defence of his own innocence, if Parliament voted aye, Strafford would die. A petition circulated London and attracted between 20 and 30,000 signatures, despite a royal order to the Lord Mayor to suppress it. The petition was brought before the Commons on the 21st, the same day they were due to vote on the attainder. Lo and behold, the bill passed by 204 votes to 59. Some were said to have voted for it, or abstained, out of a fear of the mob. A list of, quote, betrayers of their country, end quote, was posted at the exchange. These enemies of the people were those MPs who voted against the attainder. This included the call for the, quote, enemies of the Commonwealth to perish with Strafford. The successful bill was then passed to the Upper House of Lords, along with the public petition of more than 20,000 signatures. The Lords did their best to ignore the Bill of Attainder, many of them put off by the attitude of the Commons, and continued with Strafford's trial as if the Commons had not already found him guilty. Yet, 
the public pressure now came to bear on them. While the Lords were deciding how to vote, others were considering alternative means to save the Lord Deputy. And so now, we talk about the army plot. What we know is that a scheme to seize the Tower of London with troops from the Portsmouth garrison and the Royal Army and spirit Strafford to safety. But someone talked. Someone always talks. However, it seems that at least this time, they were meant to talk. It seems that part of this strategy, at Charles's urging, was for the plot to be leaked to Parliament. The hope was that this threat of military intervention would be enough to cow the moderates in Parliament into voting against Strafford's death. It was a deterrent, a stick, to go with the carrot. What carrot, you ask? The carrot which Charles offered to the Lords on the 1st of May. He would dismiss Strafford from all officers and never have him in his service again. He would not countenance his minister's death, he declared, so this was the next best thing. They had best take it. Well, Parliament called Charles's bluff. The next day, on the 2nd of May, with rumours of military intervention rife and the King's open admission that he would not execute Strafford, the crowds of London were subjected to preaching and street speakers demanding justice. The intentionally leaked plot had backfired, and now it was feared that the army would be used not just to free Strafford from the Tower, but to seize Parliament itself, or to suppress the London crowds. Amid all these suspicions and rumours came a nugget of truth. A Colonel Billingsley, an officer from Strafford's Irish army, had reached the Tower of London at the head of a hundred men, with a writ from the King demanding entry. The Lieutenant of the Tower denied him, and the next day Parliament was surrounded by crowds demanding justice for all other traitors. On the 3rd of May, the Commons drew up a protestation, which included a pledge to defend the true religion against popery, the King's royal person, honour and estate, the privileges of Parliament, and the rights of the subjects. Two days later, it was printed and published, and transformed into a national subscription campaign over the next few weeks. Now, on the 7th of May, came another radical constitutional change. The Triennial Act, which we discussed last week, ensured regular parliaments in the same style as the Scots, but it did nothing to protect the current parliament from dissolution. So the Commons rushed through a bill, preventing the dissolution of Parliament without its own consent. This would be passed by the Lords the following day, and only awaited the King's assent. In the Lords, the matter of Strafford's attainder was coming to its climax. Despite the pleas of the King, Strafford's defenders were disappearing under the weight of public opinion, horror at the army plot, a willingness to sacrifice Strafford to reunite the realm, or the assumption that Charles would just veto the Bill of Attainder anyway. The House of Lords had already faced only average attendance of its membership in the previous weeks, and this number dropped precipitously. The Earl of Bristol, one of Strafford's defenders, excused himself from the vote with the excuse that he'd been a witness in the trial. Strafford's former father-in-law, John Hollers, the Earl of Clare, also abstained from the vote, Perhaps the biggest blow was the request by Bishop John Williams for the bishops to be excused, with the reason being that the bishops had been absent at the trial. As William R. Stacey sums up, quote, In the end it was not proof of facts or arguments of law which decided the bill's fate in the Lords. It was loss of nerve and cynical calculation. On the 7th of May, the same day that the Commons passed their bill against a sudden dissolution, the Lords voted to pass the Bill of Attainder by a substantial majority. Among those who voted against his attainder is the perhaps surprising presence of Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, who had previously clashed with Strafford. He had presided over the trial in his position as steward of the King's household, and it was possibly due to this position that he voted against Strafford's death. But the Bill had passed. 
and now all eyes turned to the king. What would Charles do? The bill had passed on a Friday, and Charles spent the weekend in agonising indecision. On the one hand, he wanted to save Strafford. The Earl had shown himself to be loyal and competent. Charles had never believed him guilty of treason, and Strafford had ably proven himself not guilty in his trial, hence Parliament's sidestepping of the process. It would be unjust and unkingly to sign his death warrant, and after the Commons passed the attainder, Charles had written to the Earl, imprisoned in the Tower, promising, quote, On the word of a king, you shall not suffer in life, honour, and fortune. He'd done what he could to convince the Lords to reject the bill, but it had come to naught. It had passed, and the bill was escorted to him for his assent by an angry and armed crowd. In every interpretation of these events I've seen, it was this crowd which sealed Strafford's fate. The people of London had been whipped into a frenzy over Strafford for months, and just as the fear of the mob had worked wonders on the Straffordians in Parliament, so too did it work on the King. Angry and restless Londoners weren't just at the gate. They were past the gate, they were within the Palace of Whitehall. There were ominous rumours that his wife, Queen Henrietta Maria, would be the next targeted by a vengeful and rabidly anti-Catholic Parliament and crowd if Strafford was pardoned. And this wasn't idle talk. Many feared that Charles had been compromised by a popish plot, with the Catholic Queen the spider at the centre of the web. Her servants and friends had already been questioned by Parliament, and many had fled the kingdom entirely. Parliament had begun demanding that she have no Catholic servants or courtiers, to her horror and outrage. An earlier plan of the Queen's to depart London for the recently fortified Portsmouth, or her native France, had come to nothing, and left Henrietta Maria and her children in London. In danger. After the exposure of the army plot, Wentworth had written to the King to release him from his earlier oath to save him, come what may. This did nothing to ease the King's conscience over that fateful weekend. Strafford's biographer, Ronald G. Ash, suggests that this letter, and Strafford's willingness to sacrifice himself for the good of the King and his kingdoms, could have been used to win clemency from Parliament, and yet Charles hadn't used it. At a meeting of the Privy Council, late on Sunday evening, Charles came to his decision. If Charles had been alone in Whitehall, if his family had been safely away from the city, and only his life was at risk, he would, quote, gladly venture it to save Lord Strafford's, end quote. As it was, his family were in danger, and the situation looked set to escalate dramatically if he resisted. So despite seeing it as an evil act, Charles gave his assent to the Bill of Attainder the following day, on the 10th of May. He signed the warrant for Strafford's execution, and he would regret this betrayal of his loyal servant for the rest of his life. He also gave royal assent to the bill, preventing him from dissolving the current parliament without their consent. One can only imagine how powerless the king felt in this moment. For his part, despite his earlier urging for Charles to act in the greater good, Strafford nevertheless took his imminent execution somewhat personally, because, you know, you would. Put not your trust in princes, he was said to have remarked when hearing the news. His fellow prisoner, William Lord, was likewise bitter at Charles's capitulation. Strafford had been brought low because his king, quote, knew not how to be or be made great. Two days later, Strafford addressed an assembly of the lords in the tower, and I'll read the start. Quote, right honourable, and the rest, you are now come to convey me to my death. I am willing to die, which is a thing no more than all our predecessors have done, and a debt that our posterity must in their due time discharge, which since it can be no way avoided, it ought the less to be feared. For that which is common to all ought not to be intolerable to any. It is the law of nature, the tribute of the flesh, remedy of all worldly cares and troubles, and to the truly penitent a perfect path to blessedness. 
After his speech, Strafford was then escorted to the scaffold on Tower Hill. Lord was there, and he attempted to bless his former colleague, but the stress and emotion was too much for him, and he fainted. Once at the scaffold, Strafford spoke to the crowd. Then he touched the hands of many of the nobles present, and then requested the chance to pray. After praying, he called his brother George to him, and gave him messages to pass on to his sister, his wife, his sons and daughters, including his newborn. Quote, One stroke will make my wife husbandless, my dear children fatherless, and my poor servants masterless, and separate me from my dear brother and all my friends. Strafford removed his doublet, quipping that he no longer feared death, and was undressing with the same calm he felt getting ready for bed. He wrapped his hair under a white cap and called the executioner. The man asked for forgiveness for the act he was about to commit, and Strafford readily gave it. The Archbishop of Armagh was joined by another minister, and both flanked the condemned earl. After praying again, Strafford practised laying his head on the block, and told the executioner he would give the signal to strike by stretching out his arms. Strafford lay his head on the block for the final time. He stretched out his arms, and the axeman struck, cleanly beheading him. The decapitated head was then shown to the crowd, and the executioner proclaimed, God save the king. Thomas Wentworth, 1st Earl of Strafford, Lord Deputy of Ireland, President of the Council of the North, Lieutenant General of the Army, and Charles I's most powerful minister since the Duke of Buckingham, was dead. London was jubilant. A tyrant had faced justice. The crowds at Strafford's execution cheered, and in the evening, bonfires lit up the city. Many in Parliament hoped that a corner had now been turned, and with Strafford's obstructive influence removed, the king would be more conducive to reform. Charles did not see things in the same light. He, a divinely ordained and crowned monarch, had just been forced by the threat of mob violence against his family to approve the murder of a loyal man. He would not forget this, and he would not forgive those responsible, least of all, himself. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to my royal favourites, Mike Sanders and Owen Cotton, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner. They are joined by the Earl Rock, John Kruger, Earl of Surrey, and Jürgen, Baron Baird. If you'd like to join their ranks and receive ad-free versions of this and every other episode, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Thank you to everyone who's left reviews on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, and everyone who's told a friend about the show. Remember to give Revolution 1 and Historical Blindness a listen if you haven't already. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and, as always, to you for listening.